welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Also, welcome to the third episode of Titanic Month here on the channel. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of RMS Titanic in April of 1912 and the events that caused the tragic deaths of so many. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, negligence, and graphic descriptions of death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a ship designer, mariner, or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. Today, there will be some terms in the French, Gaelic, and German languages in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. One more very important note before we begin, all three ships of the Olympic class of the White Star Line are beloved by many, including myself. There is an enormous amount of information on RMS Titanic and her sinking, some of it conflicting. I will be pulling from many sources and going off of the most common findings among researchers. Please note that as soon as I click post on this video, the information will be outdated. With all of the Olympic class ships, there is new information coming out all the time. There are many details I might leave out for brevity's sake, and no, I don't do that to hide information or confuse. If corrections are to be made in the comments section or additional information added, please feel free to do so respectfully. There's no need to get nasty with one another over 110 year old vessels that none of us were personally there to witness or record information about. We want to keep our comment section a safe, fun place to talk about our love of ships. All right, everyone. Last week, we went over all of the engineering, architectural, and design aspects of Titanic leading up to her maiden voyage. This week, we cover her maiden voyage and the tragic sinking. There's a bit of background information before we begin our voyage, and we'll cover that now. Both of the eldest sisters of the Olympic class, RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic, were registered in Liverpool for their home port. The offices of both White Star Line and Cunard Line were in Liverpool as well, making it an easy choice for a home base. Until the introduction of RMS Olympic, most British ocean liners sailed to New York City from Liverpool instead of Southampton, heading to a port of call in Queenstown, Ireland, which is current-day Cove, Ireland. Since White Star Line's conception in 1845, the majority of their operations took place in Liverpool. In 1907, however, White Star Line revolutionized the transatlantic passenger trade by opening up another route from Southampton to New York with a stop in Cherbourg and one in Queenstown. And this was known as White Star Line's express service. One of the main advantages of many that Southampton had over Liverpool was its proximity to London, as well as the fact that Southampton is located on the south coast of Great Britain, so it's an ideal place to travel south along the English Channel and make their port of call at Cherbourg, which is located on the northern coast of France. This way, British ships could capitalize on the clientele from continental Europe before recrossing the Channel and scooping up more passengers from Queenstown. The route from Southampton to Cherbourg to Queenstown to New York City became so immensely popular that most British ocean liners, even outside the White Star Line, began using that port after World War I. Though we shouldn't knock on Liverpool since that's where the Beatles came from, and the shipping companies knew Liverpool needed her fair dues as well, and so they continued to register ships there up until the early 1960s. Queen Elizabeth II, also nicknamed QE2, was a Cunarder and one of the first ships registered in Southampton when she was introduced into service in 1969. There's only one ocean liner in the world that still performs regular transatlantic crossings between Southampton and New York City, and that is another Cunard line ship, the RMS Queen Mary II. If you've listened to our channel for a while, you're familiar with my husband Derek, and I've told him I'd love to take a cruise on Queen Mary II for our honeymoon. Fingers crossed, it's tied between that and Hawaii for us. Okay, back to Titanic. 
As for RMS Titanic, her maiden voyage was to be the first of many running this famous route on westbound runs, and she was intended to return to Plymouth in England when heading home from New York. Her entire schedule of planned voyages all the way up until December 1912 is extant, and it's so sad to look back upon. They were so sure and so full of hope, and it just wasn't meant to be. After the route was established, four White Star liners were assigned to it before the Olympic class. RMS Teutonic and RMS Majestic from the Teutonic class, RMS Oceanic, and the new RMS Adriatic, the youngest sister in the Big Four. I'm planning on covering the Big Four here relatively soon, so if you'd like to see that, let me know in the comments section. RMS Olympic would enter service in 1911, and so she would take the place of RMS Teutonic, and Titanic was planned to take the place of RMS Majestic. RMS Teutonic would be placed on the Dominion Line's Canadian service after RMS Olympic took her place on the Southampton to New York City route. In August of 1911, RMS Adriatic would then be transferred to the Liverpool to New York City route, which was still considered White Star Line's main service at that time. In November, RMS Majestic would be withdrawn from service entirely and mothballed. In nautical terms, mothballing a ship means setting it aside temporarily, postponing work on it, or to keep in readiness for eventual use. After RMS Titanic sank, RMS Majestic was placed back on the Southampton to New York City service alongside RMS Olympic. Initially, the White Star Line planned on Olympic and Titanic running the same routine their predecessors had, with each of them sailing once every three weeks from Southampton and New York City. Typically, they'd leave at noon each Wednesday from Southampton and each Saturday from New York City, which would allow the White Star Line to offer weekly services across the Atlantic both ways. If this had gone according to plan and Britannic had joined her two sisters, I fully believe the three of them would have been the unstoppable force of luxury on the Atlantic Ocean, offering a weekly bougie service across the ocean. There were special trains to take passengers to Southampton from London and to Cherbourg from Paris, scheduled to coincide with transatlantic crossings of the Olympic sisters. The new deep water dock in Southampton that opened in 1911, which was specifically designed for the enormous ships, was known as the White Star Dock at that time. However, at this point in our story, RMS Titanic is in port in Southampton. She isn't going anywhere without her crew. We'll get to them next. RMS Titanic had about 885 crew on board when she left Southampton, and like similar vessels at the time, she didn't have a permanent crew. This meant that the majority of her crew were casual workers who hopped aboard a few hours before she left Southampton. There was a recruitment process and it began on March 23, 1912, with some of these recruits being sent to Belfast to take part in her sea trials, which we covered last week. The most senior of White Star Line's captains and the commodore of the line due to his experience and seniority in the company was Captain E.J. Smith. He'd captained RMS Majestic for many years, and he'd captained RMS Olympic before RMS Titanic, but we covered that in our Olympic episode at the beginning of this month. He'd be taken from RMS Olympic to serve on RMS Titanic, and this was supposed to be his final voyage before he'd retire, which is just heartbreaking when you really sit and think about it. The chief mate of Titanic was another RMS Olympic transfer, Mr. Henry Tingle Wild, with the previous chief mate and first officers being bumped down to first officer and second officer. The first officer was William McMaster Murdoch, and the second officer was Charles Lightuller, with the original second officer just being dropped from the crew. His name was David Blair, and I'm sure he considered himself lucky after he had heard what transpired from that ill-fated maiden voyage. Herbert Pittman MBE, which stands for the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire and is a British Order of Chivalry, was the third officer and he was the only deck officer who didn't serve in the Royal Navy Reserve. Pittman was also the second to last surviving officer of the tragedy. If you were part of Titanic's crew, you'd find yourself in one of three principal departments. Victualing, which is meal planning, with 494 crew being designated here, Engine, with 325 others being designated here. And finally, Deck, with 66 crew designated for this position. Most of the crew weren't even seamen. 
Most of them were stokers, engineer, or firemen responsible for taking care of the engines, or stewards, stewardesses, or galley staff that were in charge of taking care of the passengers and providing that white star level of service at sea. Of the crew, 97% were men, and merely 23 of them were female, and they were primarily stewardesses. There were plenty of other positions, if none of the above tickle your fancy. You could have been a cleaner, bed maker, waiter, dishwasher, fishmonger, baker, chef, butcher, gymnasium instructor, laundry person, or even a printer who was responsible for creating a daily newspaper for the passengers called the Atlantic Daily Bulletin. It was filled with news passed along from the ship's two wireless operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride. For most of the crew, they signed up in Southampton on April 6, 1912, with 669 crew coming from Southampton, and 40% of these men and women were natives of Southampton. This is why the sinking and the tragedy of Titanic is so important for the town of Southampton, since so many of the victims were natives. This is why the commercialization and romanticizing of the sinking is such a delicate, tough subject to discuss. As for the rest of the crew, a few of the specialist staff were subcontractors or self-employed, like the wireless operators. They were employed by the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. Other employees that fell into this category were the staff of the a la carte restaurant and the Café Parisien, the eight musicians who were employees of a separate agency and traveled in the second class, and the five postal clerks, who worked for the United States Post Office Department and the Royal Mail. As for your pay as a crew member, it varied wildly. Captain Smith made a handsome 105 pounds a month, which is equivalent to about 15,344 pounds and 33 pence in 2023. The stewardesses, however, earned a mere three pounds and 10 shillings a month for their services, and that only adds up to 453 pounds in 2023 given inflation. However, it wasn't all bad. The lower level staff could receive tips to supplement their income, so if you were an outstanding first class steward or stewardess, you could make a decent living for yourself. Now let's imagine you are a steward or stewardess for the first class on RMS Titanic. You'd find yourself surrounded by the elite and affluent, with some of them being Mr. John Jacob Astor IV and his lovely young wife Madeline, who is pregnant at the time, and even Benjamin Guggenheim and the owner of Macy's, Isidore Strauss, and his wife Ida. Now, there were many more worthy of noting, the unsinkable Margaret Molly Brown, Archibald Gracie, and even the chairman of the Holland American line, Mr. Johan Rucklin. We aren't going to cover everybody's name, just know that most everyone who was considered a somebody was there, and if you were their steward, it would be a lot of pressure. Of Titanic's approximately 1,317 passengers, 324 were in the first class, 284 were in the second class, and 709 were in the third class. Roughly 66% or 869 of these passengers were male, and 34% or 447 were female among all of the classes. There was a total of 107 children aboard, a majority of them traveling with their families in the third class. Surprisingly, for the amount of hype around the launching of this ship, she was considerably under her maximum capacity of 2,453 passengers for her illustrious maiden voyage. Considering the disaster to follow, it was sadly a good thing that there weren't more aboard. Usually, much anticipated luxury vessels like Titanic would have been fully booked, but there was a national coal strike in the UK that caused a huge disruption to shipping schedules in the spring of 1912, and it caused a lot of crossings to be canceled altogether. So, many passengers destined to cross on Titanic decided to postpone until the strike was over, and it officially finished a few days before Titanic set sail. But by that point, it was too late for those passengers to rebook, and so she was at a smaller capacity. The only real reason Titanic was able to sail during the coal strike was because coal was taken from ships tied up in Southampton and put into her bunkers, like the Inman Line's SS City of New York and White Star Line's RMS Oceanic, and thankfully Olympic had just returned from a journey, and her leftover coal that was being stored at the White Star dock was also added into Titanic's bunkers. There would be a fire in the coal bunkers on board Titanic that might have contributed to her sinking, but we will cover that a little later on. J.P. Morgan, the owner of Titanic and the International Mercantile Marine Company, which owned the White Star Line, 
was supposed to be on board Titanic, but he canceled at the last minute for some reason. Two prominent members of White Star Line and Harlan and Wolf were aboard the ship, however. The managing director for the White Star Line, J. Bruce Ismay, the son of Thomas Ismay, and Titanic's designer Thomas Andrews, a kind-hearted, generous man who was aboard Titanic to observe problems, take notes for tweaking later on, and assess her general performance. He was known to be a genius of design and incredibly detailed. I would have loved to watch him survey the ship. The reason why we don't exactly know how many people were on board and the number is only an estimate is because not everyone who bought tickets boarded the ship, and some were only on board until they got off at one of the two ports of call. Around 50 people canceled for this or that, but who knows if the number of cancellations was higher or lower. As for the fares, they did vary depending upon which class was booked. If you were booking as a first-class passenger, you'd pay about £23, which doesn't sound like much, but that would be about £3,361.14 in 2023, or even up to £870 in high season, which would be £127,138.77 in 2023. For the third class, you'd pay about £7.05 in 1912, and this is if you paid for your fare in London, Southampton, or Queenstown, and that would be about £1,096.02. For comparison, to sail on Cunard's Queen Mary II for an eastbound transatlantic crossing spanning eight nights would cost between $1,009 and $5,349 per person, depending upon which room you choose. I'm only using Queen Mary 2 for this comparison simply because QM2 and Titanic are transatlantic ocean liners. The fare is paid, the crew is settled, and finally the passengers have been embarked in Southampton. Finally, dear listeners, it's time to set sail. On Wednesday, April 10th, 1912, at 9.30 a.m. after the crew had settled onto the ship, the passengers started to arrive after the London and Southwestern Railway's boat train from London Waterloo Station reached Southampton Terminus Railway Station on the quayside, right beside Titanic's berth. The third-class passengers were first, since they were the vast majority on the ship, with first and second class following after this up to an hour before the ship was to set sail. Stewards showed up to lead passengers to their cabins, and for the first class, they were personally greeted by none other than Captain Smith himself. As for third class, they'd be screened for sickness or physical impairment that might lead them not being allowed into the United States, since the White Star Line wanted to avoid having to carry anyone who failed the United States examination back east on the Atlantic. Of the estimated 920 passengers that boarded in Southampton, 494 were in the third class, 247 were in the second class, and 179 were in the first class. And, as we know, additional passengers would be scooped up both in Cherbourg and in Queenstown before she'd set out for the open Atlantic, stretching her legs for the first time. As scheduled, Titanic left the dock at noon, narrowly avoiding a collision with the moored liners SS City of New York of the American Line and RMS Oceanic, her destined running mate on the route. The reason for this accident was because of Titanic's massive displacement as she passed by, with a bulge of water in her wake lifting the ships and then dropping them into a trough. SS City of New York's mooring cables could not take the sudden strain Titanic put on them and they snapped free from the dock, swinging the ocean liner wildly stern first toward Titanic's bow. Luckily, the Vulcan, a nearby tugboat, swooped in and took SS City of New York under tow, saving both ships from a collision. Captain Smith, heart pounding, ordered the ship's engines full astern at this moment. It was a close one with this brand new ship, and he didn't want another collision on his record like the Olympic and HMS Hawk. The accident was avoided by just four feet of distance, and this incident put a delay on Titanic's departure for roughly an hour while SS City of New York was corralled like a loose horse. My only thought here is, if she'd collided with SS City of New York and had to return to Belfast for repairs, would that have delayed her journey enough to avoid icebergs altogether? We'll never know. After this whole incident was handled safely, Titanic steamed ahead through the complex tides and channels of Southampton Water, which is a tidal estuary south of Southampton, and then she passed into the Solent, a strait between the Isle of Wight and mainland Great Britain roughly 20 miles long. She left behind the Southampton pilot as they passed the NAB Lightship, which is currently NAB Tower, 
a tower for anti-submarine protection in the Solent during World War I that replaced the well-known lightship that was sunk during the war. It marks the entry into deep water past the Solent. She steamed ahead into the English Channel, heading for Cherbourg about 77 nautical miles away. The weather was windy, cold, and overcast, but still pretty decent. There was a tiny problem at Cherbourg. There weren't berths large enough for Titanic, they hadn't prepared for a ship of her stature quite yet, and so that is where the tender boats came into play. There were two tender boats to tend to the Olympic-class liners, SS Traffic and SS Nomadic, the latter of which is still in existence as a museum ship in permanent dry dock in Belfast, Ireland today. These tenders would ferry the passengers from the shore to Titanic, SS Traffic primarily for the third class and SS Nomadic tending mostly to the first and second class. These two tender ships were launched shortly after Titanic. Titanic arrived in Cherbourg four hours after leaving Southampton, and there she received 270 more passengers via the tender boats, 102 third-class passengers, 30 second-class, and 142 in the first class. 24 passengers from Southampton left Titanic on the tenders to head back to shore, being that they only paid for a cross-channel passage, and it only took 90 minutes to transfer all of the passengers to and from the shore. At 8 p.m., Titanic weighed anchor, which is a nautical term indicating the final preparation of a sea vessel for getting underway, and she headed off for Queenstown, Ireland. The weather was still cold and windy that evening, so most everyone was within the belly of Titanic, exploring the beautiful liner. At 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, April 11, 1912, Titanic steamed into Cork Harbor, which is a natural harbor and river estuary at the mouth of the River Lee in County Cork, Ireland, on the south coast. It was partly cloudy that day with a brisk wind, but a bit warmer than the day before. It would be an alright day for a stroll along the boat deck, if you so pleased. 123 more passengers would cross the gangway onto Titanic in Queenstown, three of which were from the first class, seven from the second class, and 113 were third class. This shows the economic difference between people in England, France, and Ireland at the time, in my opinion. There were many Irish immigrants longing for a better life in America, where they'd sadly faced discrimination there as well, with signs plastered all over businesses stating, Irish need not apply. Interestingly, President John F. Kennedy, who hailed from Irish heritage, faced discrimination of this sort along as the rest of his family. But as we know, the Kennedy dynasty would prevail in America during the mid to late 20th century. There were passengers who disembarked in Queenstown after only purchasing an overnight passage from Southampton, and there were only seven of these passengers, one of which being Francis Brown, a Jesuit trainee and a keen photographer who took many beautiful photos of Titanic including one of her last known photographs. A Jesuit is a member of the Society of Jesus, and it is a religious order of clerics regular of pontifical rite for men in the Catholic Church headquartered in Rome, for those who didn't know. As for the last known photograph of Titanic as she steamed away from Cherbourg was taken by another cross-channel passenger, Kate O'Dell. Derek actually purchased a copy of this photograph for me for Christmas one year, and it hangs in our house. It's a gorgeous, haunting photograph. There was one very unofficial departure of a crew member, a stoker by the name of John Coffey, and he was a native of Queenstown who snuck off the ship by hiding under mailbags that were being taken to shore. After everyone was ashore and the passengers ferried to Titanic were settled, she'd weigh anchor for the very last time at 1.30 p.m., though no one figured this would be the last. She set sail for New York City, full of hope, a ship of dreams. Before we really dive into the sinking, we do have to note what the original plan was. She was supposed to dock at New York Pier 59 on the morning of April 17, 1912, though we all know she'd never make it. She left Queenstown and followed the Irish coast as far as Fastnet Rock, which is roughly 55 nautical miles from Queenstown. From there, she would travel 1,620 nautical miles along a great circle route across the northern Atlantic Ocean. In mathematics, a great circle or orthodrome is the circular intersection of a sphere and a plane passing through the sphere's center point, so essentially this was the path of least resistance. Titanic would just pass the part in the ocean known as the Corner, just southeast of Newfoundland, and this spot is where westbound steamships would carry out a change of course to follow the coastline. Titanic was only a few hours past the corner on a rum line leg of 1,023 nautical miles to Nantucket Shoals Light when she would meet her maker. 
A rum line, rum or loxodrome, is an arc crossing all meridians of longitude at the same angle. That is, a path with constant bearing as measured relative to true north. Nantucket Shoals Light marks a dangerously shallow water in the Atlantic Ocean that extends from Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, eastward for 23 miles and southeastward for 40 miles, and in some places it's as shallow as 3 feet. The Italian ocean liner SS Andrea Doria sunk near Nantucket in the 1950s, and we have an episode on her if you're interested. Had Titanic not struck the iceberg, she would have progressed to her final leg in the journey. This was around 193 nautical miles to Ambrose Light, or the Ambrose Tower, which was the light station at the convergence of several major shipping lanes in lower New York Bay, including Ambrose Channel, which was the primary passage for ships entering and departing the port of New York and New Jersey. Then she was supposed to finally dock in New York Harbor. That's the brief rundown of the journey, and now let's get into some more detail. The first three days of the voyage from Queenstown were apparently without incident, though we do have to note that a fire had begun in Titanic's coal bunkers approximately 10 days before she left Southampton, as we stated earlier. This fire would continue to burn for several days into the voyage, though allegedly it was put out on April 14, 1912, the day she'd hit the iceberg. The passengers were not aware of this potentially dangerous situation, since it wasn't uncommon for fires to happen on steamships due to spontaneous combustion of the coal, which is astonishing to me. The way they had to put out the fires was to use fire hoses and moving the coal on top to another bunker. They'd take the burning coal and simply throw it in the furnace, which makes sense to me. Though there isn't proof, there's been much speculation, discussion, and research done into the effects of the fire and the attempts to extinguish it. It could have warped or weakened the steel plating and rivets of the Titanic, making her weaker to impact. After departure from Queenstown on April 11th to local apparent noon the next day, which is solar time and it's a calculation of the passage of time based upon the position of the sun in the sky, RMS Titanic steamed 484 nautical miles the following day, making 519 nautical miles of headway, and by noon on the final day of her voyage as we know it, 546 nautical miles. This is because she was constantly increasing speed, since J. Bruce Ismay wanted her to reach the harbor by Tuesday, and Captain Smith wanted the glory that came with it. Of course, these are based upon eyewitness account, so I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. I wasn't there to speak to them, so I can't fully say what their desires were. From this point until her sinking, she'd travel another 258 miles, and she averaged about 21 knots, though she would travel much faster and much slower than this at different points in the journey. Meanwhile, passengers were enjoying strolls on the deck, meals in the dining rooms, and all of the wonderful amenities Titanic had to offer. Since she'd cleared Ireland, the sky was cloudy with a headwind, but temperatures were still fairly mild up to Saturday, April 13th. But she'd crossed into a cold weather front on the 14th with strong winds and heavy seas, with waves up to 8 feet high. It died down as the day progressed until the sea was as still as glass and the sky was clear and moonless on the evening of Sunday, April 14th, 1912. That evening was extremely cold, with anyone daring to stroll the boat deck that time of night surely being bundled up and not staying out long. It was 50 degrees Fahrenheit at noon, but according to the Washington Post, it had dipped down to 33 degrees in the evening, dipping just below freezing by 10.30 p.m. that night. The water temperature of the ocean that night was 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is lethal for any person. The ice conditions on the North Atlantic were the worst they'd been for April in 50 years up to that point, and so, of course, the crew of Titanic would hear about it. While out on the ocean, Titanic would receive six warnings about drifting ice in the area of the Great Banks of Newfoundland from multiple ships. However, they were ignored by Captain E.J. Smith. Hell, passengers of Titanic even saw ice during the afternoon of April 14th. One of the ships that warned Titanic was Atlantic Line's SS Maseba, built in 1897. Another of these ships was the ever-controversial SS Californian, a British Leyland Line steamer that was allegedly the only ship close enough to visibly see Titanic from their deck. However, the crew took no action to save the doomed ship's passengers and crew. We'll talk about that a bit later, but for now, back to Titanic. Titanic would continue full steam ahead, which seems reckless to those of us looking back, but it was commonplace at the time. 
She wasn't actively trying to set a speed record, however, timekeeping was a priority, and ships were pushed to continue at full speed ahead to keep good timing. Again, there is the alleged story that J. Bruce Ismay and Captain Smith were trying for speedy glory, but it isn't confirmed. Ice warnings weren't seen as death sentences, but advisories at the time and reliance was placed in the hands of the lookouts and the watch on the bridge. We have to note that Titanic left her only pair of binoculars at the dock in Southampton, so her lookouts were at a disadvantage, especially in the dark on calm seas with no moon and going as fast as possible. Ice was seen as an inconvenience rather than a real danger for large vessels, though there had been some rare close calls, and even a few head-on collisions that weren't disastrous. In 1907, a German liner called the SS Kronprinz Wilhelm of the Norddeutscher Lloyd Line, which is now part of Hapag Lloyd, rammed an iceberg head-on but still completed her voyage with all of her watertight doors closed. And Captain E.J. Smith himself even said in 1907 that he, quote, could not imagine any condition which would cause a ship to founder. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. The sad, devastating irony in that statement cannot be understated. It has been said that if Titanic had struck the iceberg head-on instead of veering and sideswiping it, there was a possibility she could have survived, but we'll never know for sure. All right, everyone, we are at the point that everyone has been waiting for. Remember, there are a lot of details about this sinking available, some contradictory, and we aren't going to delve into everything, especially if I cannot confirm it with at least two primary or secondary sources. Feel free to add more details, corrections, and discussion in the comments, but keep it respectful of one another and myself. Again, no need to get angry with each other about a ship that sank 110 years ago and none of us were there to witness it or ask anyone about it. Okay, so the radio operators of Titanic, as we know, were employees of the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company and not crew members for Titanic, so they didn't relay every single message about ICE to the crew. Their primary objective was to send and receive messages for the passengers, and weather warnings, including ICE warnings, were secondary. There was a huge line of drifting ice several miles wide and many miles long that Titanic was steaming toward and neither the radio operators nor the lookouts were aware or prepared for this. At 9 a.m., RMS Coronia of the Cunard Line, launched in 1904, reported seeing, quote, bergs, rowlers, and field ice in the area. Captain Smith acknowledged this, but took no immediate action. At 1.42 p.m., RMS Baltic, the third of White Star Line's Big Four, relayed a report they'd received from a Greek ship called Athenia that she'd been, quote, passing icebergs and large quantities of field ice. Again, Captain Smith acknowledged this warning, and this time he showed the report to J. Bruce Ismay, and Captain Smith would order a new course to be set, taking the ship farther south to hopefully avoid the ice. However, ice travels south, so this wasn't a good idea either. Three minutes later at 1.45 p.m., the Hamburg America Line ship SS America was a short distance to the south of Titanic and reported that she'd, quote, passed two large icebergs. This message would never make it to Captain Smith or the officers on Titanic's bridge. We don't know why, but it could be because at the time the radio operators were busy fixing faulty equipment and they were utterly swamped with personal messages from passengers. Infamously, at 7.30 p.m., SS Californian would report, quote, three large bergs, and later at 10.40 p.m., SS Maseba reported the following, quote, saw much heavy pack ice and great number large icebergs, also field ice. Curiously enough, this message never left the radio room. Jack Phillips, who was operating at the time, is assumed to have been so overwhelmed with passenger messages via the relay station at Cape Race, Newfoundland, that he didn't get the message up to the captain. This was also because the radio set, as we said earlier, had broken the previous day, and the operators had to repair it, which meant a backlog of messages that the two operators were trying to plow through. I'm going to make an assumption here, don't take this as fact, but if I were Jack Phillips and I was swamped like that, I'd be thinking just one more message and then I'll deliver this ice warning to the bridge, and after multiple times thinking that, I'd forget about the ice warning altogether. I'm not saying that that's what happened in Jack Phillips' case, but that is what I theorize may have happened. Famously, one final warning would come in as Jack Phillips, filled with frustration, was trying to finish his backlog of messages. 
SS Californian gave one final message for Titanic at 10.30 p.m., stating they'd halted for the night for safety about 10 miles away from Titanic. But Phillips angrily cut him off and signaled back, quote, Shut up! Shut up! I'm working Cape Race! Since the ships were so close to one another, their messages back and forth would have been incredibly loud to their operators, and this probably just pushed Phillips over the edge. Not saying he was right for doing what he did, but it's understandable to a degree. To this, Cyril Evans, the operator aboard SS Californian, shrugged his shoulders and turned in for the night, leaving their wireless station off for the night. It wasn't required at the time to have 24-7 radio communications like it is now, and we sadly have the Titanic disaster to thank for this requirement. The crew, however, was still aware from previous warnings that there was ice in their vicinity, but they continued at 22 knots, only two knots shy of Titanic's maximum speed of 24 knots. Although later her speed in icy waters would be criticized and considered reckless, it was reflective of standard maritime practice in 1912. You didn't slow down. You had a schedule to keep, and that was more important than the potential of sinking due to ice. According to the fifth officer, Mr. Harold Lowe, the custom was to, quote, go ahead and depend upon the lookout in the crow's nest and the watch on the bridge to pick up the ice in time to avoid hitting it. As we know, that was a very bad idea, and many would pay the price for this. At the time that Titanic was approaching the collision, many passengers had already gone to bed for the night. The con was passed from 2nd Officer Lightoller to 1st Officer Murdoch, with the lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee sitting in the crow's nest about 95 feet above the deck, shivering and squinting into the cold, calm night. One of the survivors of the disaster, Colonel Archibald Gracie, would go on to write that, quote, the sea was like glass, so smooth that the stars were clearly reflected. This makes it incredibly difficult to tell where the horizon is, and they didn't know what we know now, which is that incredibly smooth water like this is a sign of nearby pack ice. Drift ice, or brash ice, is sea ice that is not attached to the shoreline or any other fixed object, and it is therefore carried along by winds and sea currents. Pack ice is when all of this drift ice is driven together into a single mass. It was a moonless night and so there was very little light or anything to give indications of an iceberg in the calm, glass-like seas. Waves breaking against an iceberg makes it easier to see, but this just wasn't the case for Titanic's lookouts. Though the binoculars were left in Southampton, and this just makes life harder for the lookouts, there are some sources that claim the binoculars wouldn't have helped anyway because of the intense darkness other than the thin starlight and the light bouncing off the water from Titanic herself. Everyone was aware of the ice, since Lightoller had told everyone to, quote, keep a sharp lookout for ice, particularly small ice and growlers. I admire Lightoller for his heroism during the sinking and for warning the crew, but we do have to give Murdoch due credit. Some stories villainize him, even James Cameron's 1997 movie to a degree. He was an experienced seaman and made what he believed was the best decision. At 11.30 p.m., Fleet and Lee were squinting out into the ocean when they saw a slight haze on the horizon. They didn't make much of it, assuming it was nothing. According to some researchers, this was a mirage caused by the cold waters mixing with the warm air, causing an almost foggy haze. It's similar to a mirage of water in the desert when you look far ahead of you into the distance. It's believed this happened when Titanic entered what is called Iceberg Alley, which is also the Atlantic marine ecozone that stretches from the Davis Strait to encompass the Grand Banks, to the Avalon Peninsula on the shores of Newfoundland. The mirage would have resulted in a perception of a raised horizon, which essentially blinded the lookouts from spotting anything far away from them, even if they had the binoculars. This is why it took nine more minutes at 11.39 p.m. for Fleet and Lee to spot the iceberg directly in the path of RMS Titanic and here the fate for the ship of dreams aligned. Fleet, being the first to spot it, immediately rang the lookout bell three times and used a telephone to, in the crow's nest to phone the bridge. Sixth officer James Moody picked up the phone and Fleet desperately asked, is there anyone there? To which Moody responded, yes, what do you see? Iceberg, right ahead, Fleet replied with anxiety in his voice. Moody thanked Fleet and quickly relayed this message to Murdoch, who immediately ordered Quartermaster Robert Hikins to change course. Murdoch, it is generally believed, gave the hard a starboard order, which would mean the ship's tiller moved all the way to the starboard side to turn to port. This may seem backward, but this was commonplace on British ships of this era. 
He also rang full astern on the ship's telegraphs, which rang down to the engine room. They rang theirs back and shifted to full astern. Murdoch's goal, according to 4th Officer Joseph Foxall, was the, quote, port around maneuver. He told Captain Smith after the collision that he was trying to push the ship hard a port around the iceberg. This meant he was trying to do what Captain Scatino was attempting and failed with Costa Concordia. He was trying to first swing the bow around the iceberg and then the stern to keep the ship from hitting it at all. However, there was a delay before either order went into effect naturally because people aren't instantaneous, and it took up to 30 full agonizing seconds for the steam-powered steering mechanism to actually turn the tiller. There was also the complex task at that time of setting the engines into reverse that would have taken some time, no matter how fast the crews in the belly of Titanic worked. The center turbine could not be reversed, so this and the central propeller were stopped altogether, and they were positioned directly in front of the ship's rudder, which reduced the effectiveness of the rudder and her turning capabilities. If Murdoch had continued full steam ahead and tried this port around maneuver, Titanic might have missed the iceberg by a few feet, but again, we'll never know. There's evidence supporting the fact that Murdoch might have simply just signaled the engine room to stop, not reversed, with lead fireman Frederick Barrett later testifying that the stoplight came on, but even that order couldn't be executed completely before disaster struck. Titanic narrowly avoided a head-on collision, however her starboard side scraped the side of the iceberg, rumbling and vibrating the entire ship for around seven seconds as a long, jagged underwater spear of ice cut into Titanic. The iceberg actually punctured the ship by buckling the plates and popping off her rivets, allowing an enormous gash about 300 feet in length, about 10 feet above the keel, to be torn into the ship, at least according to a writer at the time. According to a British inquiry following the disaster, the chief naval architect for Harlan and Wolfe, Edward Wilding, calculated the basis of the observed flooding of the forward compartments 40 minutes after the collision, and based upon these calculations, he testified that the area of the hull opened up by the ice iceberg was, quote, somewhere about 12 square feet, and he'd go on to say that, quote, I believe it must have been in places, not a continuous rip. This means that it was like a dotted line, opening here and there along the scrape, but not in one giant cut. The findings in the inquiry, which we will cover more extensively next week, state that this gash was over 300 feet, and the writers took this vague estimate and ran with it. Of course, with modern ultrasound surveys of the wreckage, it's been found that the actual total area was only about 12 to 13 square feet, which is close to what Wilding found. According to Paul K. Mathias, the man who actually did these measurements, the gash in the side of the ship was actually a, quote, series of deformations in the starboard side that start and stop along the hull, about 10 feet above the bottom of the ship. That means that the estimations back in 1912 were pretty damn accurate. The longest of the dotted rips in the hull measures roughly 39 feet, and according to research, they followed pretty closely to the line of the hull plating. Because of this, it's assumed that rivets popped off the line of this hull plating, and that's what allowed all of that water to spill in. The rivets in the plates along the stern and bow were held together with double rows of wrought iron rivets, which were potentially near their stress limits before the collision due to the fire we covered earlier, and the high slag content we covered last episode in the building of Titanic. However, we have to take this with a grain of salt, because Olympic was of the exact same construction, and she took part in numerous collisions and didn't sink. She even rammed and sank U-103 with her bow, and the worst thing that happened was the twisting of the stem and the hull plates on the starboard side being buckled, with the hull's integrity still intact. And she didn't sink, as we know from the first episode of this month. All of this evidence was pointed out by a retired archivist for Harlan and Wolf named Tom McCluskey, and it's definitely something to take into consideration. We may never know exactly what caused Titanic's hull to cave in the way it did, since so many factors went into the sinking. Chunks of ice fell from the iceberg onto the forward decks, making for a hefty souvenir for a short time for some of the gleeful, blissfully ignorant passengers. Roughly five minutes after impact, all of Titanic's engines were fully stopped, and this left her slowly drifting south in the Labrador current, facing north. She struck the berg at approximately 11.40 p.m., and she'd be under the water by 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912. Above the waterline in the first-class dining saloon, there was little evidence that there might have been a collision. The stewards noticed a shudder and they assumed the ship might have lost her propeller, some betting they'd be heading back to Belfast. 
Many surviving passengers in all three classes claimed to have felt at least a bump or shudder, one simply stating it felt, quote, just as though we went over about a thousand marbles. None of them knew what had happened at this point, and they really wouldn't until it was too late. On the lower decks, which were closer to the site of impact, you'd feel it a lot more. An engine oiler named Walter Hurst said he was, quote, awakened by a grinding crash along the starboard side. No one was very much alarmed, but we knew we had struck something. According to fireman George Kemish, he heard a, quote, heavy thud and grinding tear sound from the starboard hull. That would be a lot more concerning than a slight vibration or shuddering, which is what everyone on the upper decks felt. At an estimated rate of roughly seven long tons per second, water flooded into Titanic, which is unfortunately 15 times faster than the pumps of 1912 could pump the water back out. Leading stoker Frederick Barrett and second engineer J. H. Hesketh were hit by a jet spray of icy Atlantic water in the number six boiler room and managed to escape just before the room's watertight door closed. I cannot stress the following enough. The seawater, which was below freezing, was incredibly dangerous for the engineering crew since the boilers were full of hot, high-pressure steam. If that cold water came in contact with those hot boilers, there could be a massive explosion. Immediately, the stokers and firemen were ordered to reduce the fires and vent the boilers up through the funnel venting pipes to release the pressure. And by the time they finished, they were up to their waists in freezing water. On the boat deck, the sound of steam hissing out of the funnels was deafening. From last episode, we know about Titanic's 16 watertight compartments separated by a bulkhead, each rising at least 11 feet above the waterline, and the two nearest the bow and six closest to the stern going one deck further up, though they weren't sealed at the top. Titanic's watertight doors took 30 seconds to close, with warning bells and alternative escape routes provided to the crew in case they were trapped. To close these walkways off, on the Orlop deck, F deck, and E deck, the doors closed horizontally and were manually operated, and they could be closed either at the door itself or from the safety of the deck above it. She could remain afloat with four on one side flooded. Unfortunately, six were breached. And so like water flowing from one compartment in an ice cube tray to the next, it would continue to flood until she foundered. She'd suffered damage to her four peak tank, the three forward holds, number six boiler room, and part of the number five boiler room. She was doomed, but no one knew it yet. Captain Smith was shaken awake in his cabin by the impact, and surely some expletives went through his head, as they would have mine. Immediately, he dressed himself and sped up to the bridge to assess the situation. And once he'd heard what had happened, he called upon Thomas Andrews, the man who knew RMS Titanic the best. The ship was already listing five degrees to the starboard side and two degrees down by the head, meaning her bow was dipping two degrees within the first few minutes after the collision. Thomas Andrews and Captain E.J. Smith went below decks to investigate the damage, and they found the forward cargo holds, the mail room, and the squash court were completely flooded, with water already spilling forward from there. The number six boiler room was filled up to a depth of 14 feet already, and water was spilling over the bulkhead into the number five boiler room. There, the crewmen were fighting to the death to pump the water out. The two men, surely pale by the sickening sight, retreated back up to the bridge. After 45 minutes, Titanic had already taken on at least 13,500 long tons of icy seawater, and it was more than her ballast and bilge pumps could take. The total pumping capacity of all of her pumps combined was only 1,700 long tons per hour, and so there was no way they could catch up. All they could do was buy time, and buy time the engineering crew would. Thomas Andrews did the calculations and informed Captain Smith that the first five compartments were completely flooded, and so Titanic would sink. There was nothing that could be done. According to his calculations, she'd stay afloat for no longer than about two hours from the time he broke the news, and he was pretty much right on the money. I don't know about you guys, but I feel so sad right now. At this point, only you, me, Captain Smith, and Thomas Andrews know Titanic is sinking. All of the other victims have no idea tonight will be their last. From the time she struck the iceberg to her final second afloat, at least 35,000 long tons, if not more, of water flooded into the beautiful ocean liner. This doubled her displacement from 48,300 long tons to well over 83,000 long tons. That is insane. It wasn't at a constant pace, flooding rapidly at times and slowly at others. The distribution of the flooding was uneven as well because of the configuration of her compartments as they flooded. 
with the listing first beginning on the starboard side as that side flooded first. After the flooded passageway at the bottom of the ship completed, the listing evened out for a short time, before the ship began to list to the port side up to 10 degrees as that side began to asymmetrically flood. Rapidly, the bow of Titanic would dip toward the water by four and a half degrees in the first hour of the sinking, which doesn't seem like much, but that is alarming. After this, the rate that the ship dipped forward slowed to, down to a crawl, and it was only down to about five degrees in the second hour. This made the passengers believe that there was a possibility the ship wasn't going to sink. This breaks my heart. They had false hope, and it would be dashed at 1.30 a.m. on April 15, 1912, as the bow dipped down 10 degrees all of a sudden, and rapidly the ship began to angle further and further down into the water. By 2.15 a.m., five minutes before she disappeared forever, she angled the quickest as water poured into the last bits of the unflooded rooms in the ship. As for the evacuation, we all know that it was far from perfect, and in hindsight being 2020, we'd all go back and change it, knowing what we know now. However, Captain Smith felt it was paramount that there be no panic, and so the stewards were instructed to rouse the passengers but not give them any details as to what was going on. At 12.05 a.m. on April 15th, Captain Smith ordered the crew to prepare the ship's lifeboats, uncovering them and swinging them out. He also ordered the stewards to rouse the passengers and have them don their life belts. At this point, passengers were already stirring, curious as to why the engines that had been purring constantly and lulling them to sleep were now stopped. Captain Smith told the radio operators to get distress signals out, though he wrongly told them their position was on the west side of the ice belt and directed any rescue ships to a position about 13.5 nautical miles away from where they really were. Here's where SS Californian comes in. She was allegedly close enough to see RMS Titanic from where they were stopped, but the radio operator had gone to bed. According to Walter Lord's book, A Night to Remember, they had signaled to Titanic with their Morse lamp on the deck of the ship, but Titanic either didn't see it or know how to respond. They would have been close enough to see the distress rockets, but they didn't react. Both inquiries into the sinking found that SS Californian could have saved many lives had they reacted, and so the inaction of the crew and their captain Stanley Lord were declared reprehensible. We do have to note that in 1992, the UK government's Marine Accident Investigation Branch re-examined the case, concluded that due to the limited time available, the effect of Californian taking proper action would have been no more than to place on her the task actually carried out by Carpathia, that is the rescue of those who escaped. No reasonably probable action by Captain Lord could have led to a different outcome of the tragedy. SS Californian would be sunk on November 9, 1915 by SMU-34 and U-35 during World War I. I'm no expert and I have not re-examined the case myself, but from my point of view, I would have to sorely disagree. However, we'll never know. Deep in the heart of Titanic, water was steadily coming in. The mail room was beginning to flood, and so the mail sorters tried their best to save 400,000 parcels on Titanic, but it was no use. Somewhere else, deep in the belly of the ship, air was hissing as it was being forced out by water rushing in, and above the mail room, stewards could be heard going door to door, waking the passengers and crew, and urging them to head to the boat deck. At this time, there was no PA system to get a message out quickly, so it was up to the fleet of stewards and stewardesses. At about 12.15 a.m., the stewards began their rounds to wake the passengers. If you were in first class, you could expect your steward or stewardess to not only wake you, but assist you in putting on your life belt and to get dressed, and even escorting you and assisting you with your children to the boat deck. These stewards and stewardesses didn't have as many people to care for, so their attention could be entirely devoted to you. The stewards in the second class would rouse you by knocking on your door, telling you to don your life belt, and to get to the boat deck with little to no explanation. But it was much better than if you were in the third class. There was a higher volume of people for these stewards, so you were lucky if there was shouting to put on your life belt and a bang on the door, but good luck getting any sort of explanation. And if, if you didn't speak English, you were unlikely to know what's going on. Much of the third class was roused simply by the ruckus going on around them and figured it out from other passengers, so it wasn't very well organized the further you went down into the ship if you were a passenger. Not only was the spread of information spotty, but many passengers and crew were hesitant to come up on deck. They believed they were safer on the mass of Titanic rather than tiny little boats, and it was cold outside. They'd rather stay in their warm beds. If you were a passenger, you were told it was a drill or just a precaution, but you didn't know it was sinking. 
If you were keen enough, you might have noticed a list like a few of the other passengers around you. Imagine you're standing on the deck, looking around at the scene. Officers and crewmen are readying lifeboats and discussing with one another in hushed tones. Other passengers stand around near you, shivering and rubbing their arms with their palms, and stewards assist the first-class passengers up onto the deck. Some of the other passengers have started an impromptu game of association football, known as football or soccer in America, with the ice on deck and seem to be having a grand time. It's hard to hear anything because of the loud, low-toned hissing of high-pressure steam coming from the funnels from the boilers. A fellow passenger, Lawrence Beasley, described the sound as, quote, a harsh, deafening boom that made conversation difficult. If one imagines 20 locomotives blowing off steam in a low key, it would give some idea of the unpleasant sound that met us as we climbed out on the top deck. You look over and see crew using hand signals with one another since it's impossible for them to communicate otherwise. There's a total of 20 lifeboats, as we covered last episode, with eight regular lifeboats on each side as well as four collapsibles. This can accommodate 1,178 passengers, which is just barely half of the amount of passengers around you. As we know from last episode, they never planned on using the lifeboats to hold the entirety of the population on the ship, but merely to ferry the passengers from the sinking vessel to the rescue vessel, which would surely be her soon, right? Wrong. While you stand on deck in the cold, shivering and wondering what's going on, Captain Smith is dealing with his own nightmare on the bridge. If you didn't know, Captain Smith was an incredibly experienced seaman at this point in his life, and he'd already served 40 years at sea, which included 27 years in command. This was the first deadly crisis of his career, since the collision of RMS Olympic and HMS Hawk wasn't this serious. He knew that even if all of the boats were completely full, well over a thousand people, including himself, would more than likely die. There's two scenarios for how he acted after all of this sank in. According to several sources after the sinking, in one scenario you'd see Captain Smith on deck, but he would seem rigid and indecisive, his face pale and eyes glued to the water with a sense of impending doom. He'd be paralyzed with fear to the point of indecision, privately or publicly having some sort of nervous breakdown, and being lost in a trance-like state that left him pretty much useless to the rescue effort or the mitigation of the loss of life that was about to take place. We saw this interpretation in James Cameron's Titanic film. However, the other passengers around you swear they saw Captain Smith entirely differently. He was cool and calm, taking charge of the evacuation. He'd immediately investigated the disaster as soon as the collision took place, taking two personal trips down below decks, and allegedly ordering passengers to have their life belts on and to be up on deck even before Thomas Andrews informed him the ship was doomed. You and the other passengers might have seen Captain Smith with his shoulders back and hands neatly folded behind his back as he strolled up and down the decks, personally overseeing and assisting with the loading and lowering away of the lifeboats. He was talking with passengers, sternly enforcing the evacuation orders, and insisting there be urgency with no panic. We'll never really know since all of our evidence is he said, she said, so it's up for interpretation. My personal belief is that of most researchers, which is that Captain Smith was understandably riddled with crippling anxiety and guilt that he couldn't deal with, but that is just my stance on it. Not everyone on the crew was prepared for the evacuation or even knew the gravity of the emergency. According to 4th Officer Joseph Boxall, around 12.25 a.m., Captain Smith told him the ship was sinking. But Quartermaster George Rowe didn't get the news, and he actually phoned the bridge from his watch station when he saw a lifeboat row pass to ask what was going on. Everyone was unprepared for the emergency, but that's even scarier when the crew is unprepared. Lifeboat training was extremely minimal, with the only training that happened before the sinking was a drill, if you could call it that, while the ship was docked in Southampton. It was just two boats being lowered, each with one officer and four men in it, and they just rode around the dock for a few minutes before returning to Titanic. There was actually a lifeboat drill scheduled for the morning of Sunday, April 14, 1912, but for unknown reasons, Captain Smith canceled it. Other than the wimpy lifeboat drill in Southampton, none had been done, and certainly not with the passengers. The lifeboats were supposed to be loaded with provisions, but much to the shock of the passengers, they were scarcely stocked with anything even though the ship's chief baker, Charles Yoffin, and his staff had attempted to fully stock them with hot, fresh bread and other goods. That would be disconcerting, to say the least. The crew could have been prepared, 
You might be saying, Eleanor, we know that. And believe me, it seems like there's a million reasons why they should have been. But let me give reason number one million and one. There were lists posted in cruise areas on the Titanic that detailed which crew members were assigned to which lifeboat muster stations. But of course, with everything going wrong in this story, we have to add something else. It seems that very few, if any of the crew actually paid any attention to these lists or knew what they were supposed to do. It doesn't help that most of the crew were not seamen, and some didn't even know how to row a boat before the evening of April 15th. And now these regular Joes, who didn't even know which lifeboat they were supposed to tend to, had the impossible task of organizing the escape of 1,100 people 70 feet down the side of the ship to the water. A historian of the disaster, Thomas E. Bonsall, has stated that the evacuation was so poorly organized that, quote, even if they had the number of lifeboats they needed, it is impossible to see how they could have launched them. And this has given the poor leadership, the slow start almost an hour after the collision before the first boat even hit the water, and the inexperience of the crew. Not all of the lifeboats on Titanic would even be successfully launched before she went under, though most were. Despite all of these factors, at around 12.20 a.m., 40 minutes after we've struck the iceberg, the officers and crew around you are loading the lifeboats, granted not to capacity. Just before this, you look over while steam is still venting so loudly around you, and you see second officer Lightoller cup his hands around his mouth over Captain Smith's ear, and he appears to be shouting. You can't hear him, but he recalled it like this. Quote, I yelled at the top of my voice. Hadn't we better get the women and children into the boat, sir? He heard me and nodded reply. You see, Captain Smith nod, and he orders first officer Murdoch and second officer Lightoller to, quote, put the women and children in and lower away. This had two interpretations for the officers. Murdoch thought of it as women and children first, then fill the lifeboat with whoever was standing around regardless of gender. Lightoller, on the other hand, took it as women and children only, and he'd be damned if any man snuck onto his boats. He'd literally pull them out and send the lifeboat partially empty if there were no other women and children waiting. Neither officer was aware of the 68-person capacity of these boats, and they were afraid of filling them completely just in case. However, it was safe enough to do so given the capacity of the boats and the preferable sea conditions and clear weather. If this had been done, 500 more people would have been saved. But instead, people stood on the boat deck, mostly men, as they watched lifeboat after lifeboat leave with empty seats. Needless to say, if you were a man, you'd best head to the starboard side of the ship. If you're a woman, you're safe on either side. So we are going into the lifeboat launchings. For a personal project in the past, I made a lovely little timetable and I'll put it on the screen for everyone on YouTube. For everyone listening on an audio only format, don't worry, I will verbalize it for you. This is a table of all of the lifeboats launched on the starboard and port sides in chronological order because that is how I like to receive my information. I took all of this information from Titanic, True Stories of Her Passengers, Crew, and Legacy by Nicola Pierce, but reorganized it to be Eleanor friendly. The first few lifeboats were all on the starboard side, where Mr. Murdoch was in charge. Lifeboat 7 was launched at 12.40 a.m. with either 28 or 29 survivors. Sources differ on the exact number. The next lifeboat to leave, also on the starboard side, was lifeboat 5 at 12.43 a.m. with either 35 or 36 passengers. After this, at 12.55 a.m., lifeboat 3 lowered into the water with between 32 to 50 passengers. After this, two lifeboats would leave simultaneously at 1 a.m. On the port side, under the gaze of Lightoller, lifeboat 8 left Titanic with either 27 or 28 survivors. And on Murdoch's watch over on the starboard side of the ship, lifeboat 1 left with only 12 people in it. Remember that these boats should have held 68 people each, so that is pathetic. At 1.10 a.m. on the port side, lifeboat 6 lowered away with 58 survivors on board, and the only man that Lightoller allowed onto his boats, Royal Canadian Yacht Club member Major Arthur Godfrey Puchin, and he was to be in charge of this lifeboat since there wasn't a seaman on it. On the starboard side at 1.20 a.m., lifeboat 16 lowered into the Atlantic Ocean with 50 survivors. On the port side at 1.25 a.m., lifeboat 14 lowered into the sea with 58 passengers aboard, all women and children. Again at 1.30 a.m., we had two lifeboats lower away at the same time on either side of the ship. Under Mr. Lightoller's watch, on the port side was lifeboat 12 with 30 survivors, and on the starboard side, under Mr. Murdoch's purview, was lifeboat 9 with between 30 and 40 survivors. 
Lifeboat 11 lowered into the ocean at 1.35 a.m. on the starboard side with between 50 and 70 survivors on board, making it one of the fullest lifeboats launched. At 1.40 a.m., Lifeboat 14 on the starboard side lowered away with 65 survivors on board. Now we are going to be on the port side of the ship until 2 a.m. Titanic was under the water at 2.20 a.m., so these lifeboats are going to be launched more rapidly and with more people in them. On the port side, Lifeboat 15 lowered away at 1.41 a.m. with 65 people loaded into it, and it was almost lowered directly onto Lifeboat 13 as it passed under them. The next boat in the port side to lower away was at 1.45 a.m., and it was Lifeboat 2, and it only had 17 people in it. I just cannot believe that. Lifeboat 4 and Lifeboat 10 both lowered away at 1.50 a.m. since things were really heating up and getting bad on Titanic at this point. Lifeboat 4 had between 55 and 65 survivors, and Lifeboat 10 had an unknown number of people aboard. We return to the starboard side in the last 20 minutes of Titanic remaining afloat. The collapsible lifeboats were being removed from atop the officers' quarters, all of them successfully except for Collapsible B, which fell from the roof of the officers' quarters onto the wrong side, and drifted away after the ship sank. At 2 a.m. on the starboard side, Collapsible C was launched with between 35 and 40 passengers. At 2.05 a.m., Collapsible D on the port side was launched with between 25 and 30 survivors. Back on Mr. Murdoch's half of the ship, our final lifeboat for the starboard side was launched at 2.15 a.m., five minutes before Titanic foundered, and it was Collapsible A with 10 to 12 survivors on board. Finally, as Titanic disappeared under the waves, Collapsible B floated away from the ship. Lytoller and other survivors would cling to this lifeboat until they were rescued when the other lifeboats, which had roads roughly 100 to 200 yards away. Lifeboats 8, 3, and 6 were a bit farther away since they were rowing toward the lights of the Californian that could be seen off in the distance. It's been estimated Californian was about 10 miles away, but that is unconfirmed. While lifeboats were being launched, there were things happening inside the ship. Remember how I told you there weren't many seamen aboard Titanic and so yachtsman Arthur Puchin took charge of lifeboat 6? Well, the amount of seamen was decreased around that time because some of them were sent below to open the gangway doors to allow more passengers to escape, but they never came back. It's assumed they were trapped and drowned by the water rising up from the decks below. The devastation didn't stop there. While the crew on the boat deck worked hard to evacuate the women and children, the engineers and firemen worked hard to vent steam from the boilers to prevent an explosion, opening watertight doors to set up extra portable pumps in the flooded forward compartments to slow the immense flooding, and keeping the electrical generators running as long as possible to keep the lights on for everyone, since it was such a dark, cold, moonless night, and they wanted to prevent as much panic as possible. An engineer named Jonathan Shepard fell into a manhole and broke his leg during the disaster, and a few minutes after this, him and another engineer, Herbert Harvey, died in boiler room number 5 around 12.45 a.m. when the bunker door that separated boiler rooms number 5 and 6 collapsed, and they'd be swept away by what leading fireman Frederick Barrett described as, quote, a wave of green foam. Barrett had barely escaped joining the two engineers. According to trimmer George Cavill, who survived the sinking, around 1.20 a.m. in boiler room number 4, water started to bubble up from the metal floor plates beneath them, and this could possibly mean there was a breach in the bottom of the ship too, but that's not confirmed. The water rushing in overwhelmed the pumps, and seeing there was nothing to do about it, the firemen and trimmers retreated from this boiler room, moving further aft. The ultimate sacrifice was made by multiple of these men, Chief Engineer Joseph Bell, all of his engineering colleagues and a handful of greasers and firemen all volunteered to stay behind in the number one, two, and three boiler rooms that were not yet flooded to keep the power going to the ship's pumps so they could delay the sinking, even if just for a few minutes, as well as keeping the lights on for the passengers and enough power to keep the radio room operational to flag down a rescue vessel. None of these men survived, and they sacrificed themselves willingly to save the lives of others. There are numerous sources stating they died in the belly of the ship, staying at their posts until the bitter end, whereas other sources state that when the water became too unmanageable for the pumps, the men escaped to the open well deck to see there were no lifeboats left. These same sources also state that once they were on deck, a group of eight of the 35 engineers gathered at the aft end of the starboard boat deck to await the bitter end together. None of the 35 electricians and engineers survived the sinking of Titanic. 
The five postal clerks working on Titanic also perished, with witnesses last seeing them trying to save mailbags they'd taken from the flooded mailroom. They were trapped by rising water on D-deck somewhere, and that is where they drowned. If you happened to be a third-class passenger, then you might have been one of the many that saw water pouring into your stateroom on E, F, and G decks. You might run back to your stateroom for a warm jacket before going up to the boat deck, only to find yourself up to your ankles in freezing cold water. Not a pleasant sight to see on a ship that is supposed to be unsinkable. Let's get back to the boat deck. At about 1.20 a.m., you and the other passengers around you will start to notice how serious the situation really is. You look around and see husbands and wives giving each other tearful goodbyes, the men trying to feign a brave face as they escort their wives and children to the lifeboats before standing back, looking on with glassy eyes as the boats lowered away and they gravely realized their predicament. Above you, you hear the distress rockets pop as white smoke and sparkles light up the sky. Other passengers around you are distracted by them too, despite the danger at hand. While this is going on, Harold Bride and Jack Phillips are busy sending out the distress signal CQD. CQD was one of the first distress signals adopted for radio use, first being issued on February 1st, 1904. Bride looked to Phillips and suggested to use a newly issued signal that had never been used before, but is synonymous with emergency situations nowadays, SOS. He said it, quote, may be your last chance to send it. Immediately, they sent out the signal as well, and luckily a guardian angel responded. RMS Carpathia of the Cunard Line, 58 miles away, was the closest ship to respond, though many others did and changed course for Titanic, one of which was SS Mount Temple, though she was stopped by pack ice. We have an episode on Carpathia from last year, and I'll leave a link to it in the cards. Even though Captain Rostrum of Carpathia would order more stokers for the boilers bringing her up to the fastest speed she'd ever gone at 17 knots, it would still take her four hours to reach Titanic's position, and by that time, she'd be long gone and over a thousand would be dead. As we know, SS Californian was extremely close and had stopped for the evening due to ice. On her bridge, her third officer, Charles Groves, could see the Titanic about 10 to 12 miles away off the starboard side of the ship. A little over an hour later, 2nd Officer Herbert Stone saw five white rockets popping over Titanic, and he was immediately concerned and called upon Captain Stanley Lord, who didn't act upon the report. Stone would later state that he was perturbed, saying to a colleague, quote, a ship is not going to fire rockets at sea for nothing. He was right. While you and the other passengers are now fully aware of the situation, fearful women cling to their husbands and beg for them to be allowed on the lifeboats with them, to which the officers and Captain Smith himself would continue to push for women and children to be saved first. Eloise Hughes Smith was one of these women who wanted her husband Lucian to be saved with her and pleaded with Captain Smith, but he simply ignored her, shouting through his megaphone that women and children were to board first and to board now. Lucian would say to the captain, quote, Never mind, Captain, about that. I will see that she gets in the boat. After this, he turned to Eloise, surely terrified for himself, but suppressing the sphere, and he said to her, quote, I never expected to ask you to obey, but this is one time you must. It is only a matter of form to have women and children first. The ship is thoroughly equipped, and everyone on her will be saved. Eloise obeyed, and she never saw Lucian again. When I told Derek about this, he told me he'd do the exact same thing to ensure my safety, and that just made it hit home. It's so tragic. There were many instances of goodbyes such as this, or some that were much harder. In the case of Charlotte Lottie Collier and her husband Harvey, he shouted to his frantic wife as she was loaded into a lifeboat, yelling over the confusion, quote, Go Lottie, for God's sake, be brave and go. I'll get a seat in another boat. He wouldn't, and she'd become a widow as would many women that night. Some couples refused to be separated, like Ida Strauss and Isidore Strauss, the latter of which was the Macy's department store co-owner and a former member of the United States House of Representatives. They sat together in deck chairs and went down together. Benjamin Guggenheim actually changed out of his life belt, instead getting into a sweater, top hat, and evening attire, declaring he was going to go down like a gentleman, and he did. By this desperate point in the sinking, almost everyone on the lifeboat so far is first and second class, and very few third class passengers had come up to the boat deck by this point. Many were trapped in the corridors below decks or behind gates and partitions that separated the classes. The segregation wasn't just a social thing though. 
The United States actually required this because they wanted to control immigration and prevent the spread of infectious diseases before the third class was to disembark in New York. First and second class passengers were to disembark at the main piers on Manhattan Island. However, the third class would be required to go through Ellis Island to pass health checks and undergo processing. There's been evidence, sadly, that the crew hindered the ability of the third class passengers to escape, and that could have doomed many of them. The third class had to climb winding staircases that snaked up all over the ship to reach the boat deck, which was the furthest from the third class that was kept in the fore and aft sections of the ship. Not only this, but there was a significant number of these immigrants who couldn't speak or understand English, so it only added to the panic and confusion below decks. Most of the third class that survived were English-speaking Irish immigrants because of this fact. Many of these people were saved by third class steward John Edward Hart, who organized three trips into the ship's interior to guide groups of passengers up to the lifeboats, with those who weren't part of these groups just climbing emergency ladders or finding open gates to get through. Sadly, some didn't even try to escape, either retiring to their staterooms to await death there, or gathering in a large group in the third class dining room, praying up until the end. Leading fireman Charles Hendrickson was escaping himself when he looked into the third class area of the ship and saw many confused passengers with their possessions, awaiting further instructions that would never come. This has been described as stoic passivity, caused by generations of being told what to do by their social superiors, according to psychologist Wynne Craig Wade. By 1.30, Titanic's downward list increased to 5 degrees, and the listing to port increased as that side of the ship began to flood with water. The messages leaving the radio room became more and more desperate, with the last intelligible message sent from Titanic being at 1.45 a.m., and it states, quote, Engine room full up to the boilers. The messages that followed were jumbled and scrambled, but the radio operators still tried their damnedest to continue communicating almost up until the very end. Panic first broke out on the boat deck when a group of male passengers, scared for their lives, rushed lifeboat 14 as it was being lowered. Fifth Officer Lowe was in charge of this boat, and he discharged three shots from a pistol into the air to control the crowd. No one was injured from the gunfire. On board this lifeboat was Violet Jessup, and we'll see her again in the sinking of HMHS Britannic at the end of the month. Our most controversial survivor, J. Bruce Ismay, boarded Collapsible Sea as it was lowered into the sea around 2 a.m., though some sources state it was around 1.40 a.m. He would later be condemned as a coward, a characteristic still stuck to him to this day. There's evidence pointing in both directions, so it's hard to say whether or not this choice was out of cowardice. After the last lifeboat was successfully launched, the forecastle was already well underwater. There was a lot of confusion and fear, and many witnesses claimed to have seen an officer shoot two men with a revolver as they dove for the safety of a lifeboat, before turning the gun on himself. It's always been heavily rumored that this officer was actually Officer Murdoch, even making it into James Cameron's film, though this isn't confirmed and should not be taken as fact. After Captain Smith made one final tour of the deck, filled with scared passengers scrambling for the stern, and at this point, if you're still on board, you might be one of them, Captain Smith turned to the remaining crew and the radio operators, stating, quote, Now it's every man for himself. He told the men attempting to launch Collapsible A, Well, boys, do your best for the women and children, and look out for yourselves. After this, he was seen returning to the bridge before it was swallowed by the sea. It's always been thought that he chose to go down with his ship, as was custom at the time, and died there at the bridge. But it is possible he jumped overboard from the bridge and died in the water. Harold Bride claims to have seen Captain Smith jumping from the bridge even, but we will never know that for sure. What we do know for sure is the last time anyone saw Thomas Andrews, he was in the first class smoking room around 2.05, and he made no attempt to save himself. There's also reports of seeing him before this helping with the evacuation, and even opening the kennels to free the dogs housed there. He was reportedly seen throwing deck chairs into the sea for passengers to use, and some even state they saw him jump from the bridge with Captain Smith, if he truly left. We'll never know the truth, since there's so much conflicting information. As you and the other frightened passengers scrambled for the stern, some of you may have had a confession heard by or an absolution given to by second-class passenger Father Thomas Biles as Titanic's band continued to play outside the gymnasium. 
There were actually two bands on board Titanic, the most famous of which was the quintet led by Wallace Hartley that played after dinner and at religious services, while the other band was a trio and they played in the reception area outside the cafe and restaurant. These two bands had separate music arrangements and libraries, and they had never played together until the night of the sinking. There is a huge piece of folklore in the Titanic sinking that the last song the musicians played as Titanic began her final descent was Nearer My God to Thee. However, this cannot be verified. The claim came from some of the earliest reports of the sinking, and the hymn has become synonymous with the sinking of the Ship of Dreams, so much so that the opening bars of the hymn were carved into the grave monument for Wallace Hartley, who perished that night. You and many passengers might have seen the band playing up until the deck was too steep for them to stand, with several other witnesses corroborating this. At 2.15 a.m., you've struggled to the stern and you look down as the angle of Titanic sinking rapidly increases with water pouring quickly into the previously unflooded parts of the ship. The sudden lurch caused what was called a, quote, giant wave by one survivor that swept along the ship from the bow back to the boat deck, sweeping people into the icy Atlantic. Collapsibles A and B were swept into the sea at this time. As the ship went down, Charles Lightoller, who was trying to launch Collapsible B, dove into the sea from the roof of the officer's quarters. He would be sucked up into the mouth of a ventilation shaft, but was thankfully saved by what he described as, quote, a terrific blast of hot air, and emerged next to capsized a Collapsible B. The forward funnel would then collapse, and it just narrowly missed Lightoller, creating a massive wave that sent the boat 50 yards clear of the ship. As the time ticked down, the stern rose higher into the air and the ship aimed downward, creaking and groaning under the immense pressure. Supposedly, it reached an angle of 30 to 45 degrees. At this point, you and the other passengers hear an enormous crash, loud like a massive explosion. Some attribute this to the boilers exploding, and this is when Titanic actually cracked in half because of the pressure of the stern in the air and the bow being sucked down into the sea. It snapped at the weakest point in the structure, right at the engine room hatch, and the lights went out just before she snapped, the stern falling back into the sea and crushing anyone underneath it. You're clinging to the railing of the stern as the forward end of it begins to rapidly flood, with just a tinge of that fragmented bow remaining attached to pull her under as the stern settled and filled with water, listing all the way to port and going completely vertical before disappearing into a flurry of bubbles at 2.20 a.m., two hours and 40 minutes after she hit the iceberg. Now, Titanic is gone, and you and many other passengers are left terrified and screaming for help in the water. It would be so cold that some would die immediately from shock. If you didn't die from the shock, the shock would be over after about 90 seconds. You'd have about 10 minutes before your extremities would be numb and entirely useless, and you'd die after about a half an hour to an hour of exposure, unless you were incredibly lucky. Remember, you now have to swim to the lifeboats, and they are about 100 to 200 yards away. As for Titanic, it would take about 5 to 6 minutes for her to tumble 12,451 feet down to the bottom of the ocean, the two parts of the ship landing about 2,000 feet apart from one another. She wouldn't be discovered until 1985 when Robert Ballard found her. As for the passengers, it was just the beginning of the next phase of a horrible nightmare that some would never wake from. That is the end of our episode on the sinking. We'll cover what happened to the passengers, the impact on society, and the inquiries in the next episode. I hope this has done some semblance of justice for the passengers and crew of Titanic. May they rest in peace. Thank you for tuning in to the third episode of Titanic Month on Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us, and don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the conclusion to Titanic's story, the aftermath of Titanic, including the tantalizing inquiries. Also, tune in every Monday this month for a different White Star Line-themed bonus episode. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.